and welcome to Banking Transformed. I'm your host, Jim Roos, owner and CEO of the Digital Banking Report and co-publisher of the Financial Brand. The increasing scale and pace of change has been a constant characteristic of the payments landscape, driven by rapidly changing customer experience expectations and new technologies. The ability to deliver on these expectations, however, is still very much a work in progress. Payments is an important element of a bank's overall value proposition. More than ever, financial institutions must adapt new partnership strategies and operating models while being focused on building unique differentiation. Our guest today on the Bank Transform podcast is Matthew Wilcox, President of Digital Payments and Data Aggregation at Fiserv. He discusses the evolving opportunities and challenges available in today's payments ecosystem. While strategies vary by organization, when Pfizer asked about the relative importance and priority of payments within financial institutions' overall value proposition, 84% of respondents said that payments are a critical element of their institution's value proposition. This suggests that opposed to being purely a transactional product line, payments are an important brand differentiator and link between the financial institution and its clients. You know, welcome to the show, Matt. It's been a very long time since we've gotten together, and it's hard to believe we've known each other for more than a decade, well over a decade. For those who may not know, can you provide our listeners with a short background around yourself? Yeah, Jim, thank you so much. Always great to see you. A uh, great friend and always great to have dialogue with you because you're so tapped into everything that's going on. Uh, I've been in financial services um, coming up on 25 years now, hard to believe, but uh, uh, started my work at a financial institution here in Salt Lake, uh, Zions Bank Corporation, spent 15, 16 years there doing a variety of things. Uh, uh, I was there during the transition to really too digital and got to experience that wave with a financial institution and then uh, the importance that they placed on payments. And then that led me to uh, Pfizer where I've been here the last uh, nine years or so uh, in a variety of roles, primarily in digital and payments. And now uh, with the great honor of leading our digital payments organization here. First of all, there's probably no area of banking, obviously, that has been seen more transformation since the pandemic than payments. What has been some of the most dramatic changes that you've seen in the past two years? Yeah, there's been a lot of change in the last two years, uh, even you know last three or four. But you think about uh, everybody was waiting for the kind of the year of P to P, and we finally had Zelle make its introduction, and that led to you know Cash App and Venmo, and that led to really the impetus of of real time payments. And so now real time payments is is somewhat mainstream, and there's lots of work going on with with real time, uh, we've seen a lot around integration and the integration of not just payments, but payments into the digital ecosystem. Uh, and Jim, I read all the time about the things that uh, banks are doing great and the things that banks aren't doing so well on. And a lot of times they have all the content, but are they integrating the content into the right consumer experience? And so we're seeing a lot of work and effort and investment on that creating really that control tower experience for all of your payments is, as you know, consumers, they don't want to go to their bank to just pay a bill or use Zelle or make a transfer. They want to be able to go and have and manage all of their finances in one place. Uh, we've seen the movement of data. So you talk about real time and the speed of payment. Now the inflow of real time data and more of that advisory approach to financial services. And then I think the last thing that has been around the last uh, two years, but has really started to make its way uh, the latter part of last year and a lot in this year is around cryptocurrency. Um, and I know you guys had an article recently in Financial Brand around, is it really a currency or is it an investment tool? Uh, and we're seeing a lot of interest uh, from the financial services industry and merchants uh, to accept it as a form of payment or for banks to offer some services around crypto. So that that's a, ultimately a real-time uh, payment mechanism or could be a real-time payment mechanism. So um, the industry is, is afloat and awesome and it's moving quickly. Um, and it, it really moving at the pace that I think it needs to move in to keep up uh, with all of the pace and change that's going around financial services. 
Well, you know, it's interesting. We talk a lot about the customer experience and all the changes that are going on in the front end of what people see and feel, but even more changes going on in the back end as people try to modernize their back office for the future payments. Can you share some of the major initiatives that you're seeing the forerunners doing that are keeping them up to speed or trying to keep up to speed with all that's going on in the payments marketplace? Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of uh, automation in the back end. So there's lots of processes in the back office um, that, believe it or not, are still a lot of manual processes that are taking place. And you just can't have all of that uh, when you think about fraud and risk. And so uh, as payments moves and it gets quicker and speed of payment gets faster, um, the bad guys are quick too and the money goes out and uh, there's exposure around that. And so we're seeing a lot of back office work around automation. Uh, there's a lot of AI being driven into the back office, more algorithms for fraud and risk protection. Uh, we're seeing the leaders recognize that they can't solve for a ubiquitous payment experience on their own. And so we're seeing back offices connect to multiple networks. Uh, there's multiple rails being stood up, as you know, with TCH and RTP, with FedNow, Visa and MasterCard have done a lot of work. And so in order to um, accelerate the evolution of the back office, you've got to tap into all of those other ecosystems. And uh, we're seeing work being done in connectivity in the back office. Uh, and then I think we're just seeing um, uh, centralizing all of the applications. Uh, we're seeing more what I would call layers around core banking systems to allow easier access and connectivity into the core ecosystem. Um, the core has been sort of this moat for providers like Pfizer for, for a long period of time, uh, whether you're FIS or Jack or whoever you might be. And we have to accelerate the connectivity into those cores for other applications. And so there's work being done by providers, but financial institutions have to do some of the legwork as well. You're nothing if not point blank honest about all these things. And the financial institutions are always talking the good game about building a better customer experience. Do you see most of the back office changing, really focusing on gaining efficiencies or genuinely trying to improve the customer experience? Yeah, I, I think it's both. I think the, the, the start was with efficiency. And you remember lots of conversations that we had around digital and it was always around, well, it's a lower cost to serve or it's a self-service tool. And you and I would always laugh. It's like, I don't know anybody that wants to be self-served. You want full service regardless of the channel or experience that you're having with your institution. So I think we, we as financial institutions, I'll include myself in that because that was the angle that I played, uh, we went for efficiency. It was lower cost. So therefore we should invest in these yeah. channels because it's lower cost to serve. Now it's about this supreme experience that you need to offer uh, that's really table stakes. Um, People often joke that you can order and get toilet paper from Amazon faster than you can uh, send money to Jim Maroos. Uh, and you know you just can't have that anymore. And the expectations are high. And I think now some of the work in the back office they're realizing gains efficiencies, but creates a better experience. Just by putting in more fraud and risk tools and automating that in the back end and the verification pieces, that makes a better experience for the consumer. Um, having connectivity to other networks to allow for real-time use cases to take flight um, in lots of different ways creates efficiency, but creates a better experience. So I, I do believe it started with efficiency and continues to be efficient, efficiencies, yeah. gains, but it really has to lean in on the consumer experience. So, so it's interesting. I was talking about your research study, but your most recent research study also found a surprising lack of prioritization of technology refresh and focus on compliance. Could this be an indicator that financial institutions have finally accepted that compliance and technology investments are, are basically table stakes and that while they're still very important, they don't take the prioritization structure when you say, what do I have to focus on changing? It's really more of a keep it going. Uh, Jim, I think you nailed it. I think that um, 
the dollars that we see being invested into technology infrastructure and compliance, and I'll put cyber uh, in that as well, is significant. It's massive, the number of investments. And I think what you're seeing now when you talk to financial institutions or we survey them, they're listing their top five priorities as the incremental things that they need to go do. And compliance and technology investment um, has become more table stakes. And you, you know as well as I do, there's a lot of onus that falls on uh, Fiserv and others to do a lot of that investment on behalf of the financial institutions, but the financial institutions have put it into their plans. It, it's, a, it's an always on priority is the way I'd put it. Yeah, and your research also found that payments, as I mentioned earlier, are a critical element of a value proposition that a financial institution has, and, the, and they're seen as a key differentiator for the future. That said, you know, financial institutions kind of sat in their laurels for an extraordinarily long time as fintech organizations pretty much ate their lunch in the payment space, the PayPal, the, uh, virtually any provider out there really made great headway in providing payment solutions, but also in capturing all the data that goes along with payments. Yep. Now, financial institutions are playing a game of catch up. Can, can financial institutions actually catch up to what's being done by those organizations that stole both share of mind and share of wallet. Yeah, I mean, it, it, as we talked about many times, uh, and we pushed and poked on getting the financial institutions to not just think about owning the customer or client relationship, but owning that payment relationship. Far too long, they were okay to be that sort of settlement account behind the scenes for these fintechs, because these fintechs weren't, uh, actually moving the money on their own. They were relying on a financial institution behind the scenes, but the consumer right. the consumer didn't care, right? They wanted the supreme experience. And I, th I do think financial institutions fell behind and, and we take some of that responsibility um, because we need to be more forceful and proactive in creating those experiences. I do think financial institutions can catch up. And I think it goes back to the conversation that we, the question you just asked around compliance and cyber and fraud and risk and protection. I think there's still a, and it, it's, they're losing ground here, but I still think the strength of financial institutions is the protection of the consumer. And I still believe the consumer still believes that. And I think that will always give the opportunity for the financial institution to catch up but the window is shrinking. And the window is shrinking not just because they're not um, moving fast enough, it's that those fintechs that you just talked about didn't stop, right? They're now right. moving into right. traditional banking, what you would consider traditional banking products, uh, checking accounts, they're offering cards. And so it wasn't just about capturing, it's not just about capturing that data, although they don't wanna lose that data. They could lose share of wallet now to these folks and it started with payments. Payments was the impetus to fintechs getting into the into uh, the consumer's wallet, and now it's up to the banks to play catch up. But I do believe uh, that they can catch up. Well, you know, the, the whole concept of catching up also, as you mentioned, plays into the whole dynamic of fraud and financial crime that continues to grow both in scale and the importance to financial institutions and to the regulators, obviously. How is the industry, and more importantly, providers like Pfizer, working to stay ahead of this problem that only seems to be getting worse. Yeah, I will say uh, the, our level of investment in fraud and risk and cyber crimes and the tools that we have in place from a scanning perspective um, are significant. And uh, if it's not the number one investment that we've had uh, recently, uh, it's pretty close. And I think people, and again, going to your other question around playing catch up, it's also harder to play catch up when you have all of this work that you have to do to protect the consumer. Um, and there is massive amounts of investments going in from Fiserv and other providers like Fiserv and the financial institutions uh, for fraud, uh, tools to prevent fraud, um, and I do think that we are doing a good job as an industry. Um, a lot of the fraud that uh, is out there in the ecosystem actually doesn't happen in the application itself. It happens 
either account takeover, uh, so somebody has commandeered the consumer's account and uses that can account to uh, transact unlawfully, or um, we'll pause or freeze a transaction and then the bad guy will be so compelling to get that uh, transaction to actually happen in calling or contacting the contact center at the financial institution. And so it's not just about the investment of the tools and applications and the algorithms and the AI, it's education. And you got to educate the yeah. consumer and you have to educate the frontline staff at a financial institution because these these fraudsters, not only are they good with the tools, uh, they can be pretty convincing uh, over the phone as well. Well, it's interesting. There's been a lot more talk recently about how fraud and risk can really undermine some of the fintech models that have been built because there's been a lot less emphasis probably spent on risk and fraud and much more in gaining scale. Do you think there's a lot of fintech organizations right now that are in risk be or under duress because of the fact that maybe they didn't spend as much time on some of these issues that traditional financial institutions made as part of their business from the get-go? Yeah, I, I do think that is. And I think that's why uh, financial institutions can catch up because while they may have not been in, in making the right level of investment on the consumer experience, uh, it doesn't look as shiny. You and I have always talked about chasing that shiny object. Um, they have spent time really uh, on the protection of the consumer. That's been the core and heart of the investment. And interestingly, to your question around uh, technology not being in the top priorities and is that table stakes, um, that, that really is uh, um, table stakes, but fraud and risk is in those top five. Um, the protection of the consumer is in those top five. And I do think that some of these fintechs will be under duress, whereas uh, fintechs have made those uh, significant, or the financial institutions have made those significant investments. So let's take a short break here and recognize the sponsors of this podcast. From super apps and crypto to embedded finance and financial inclusion, we're a long way away from the world of cash and checks. That's why FIS has created the Global Payments Report. The Global Payments Report makes it easy to understand what your consumers want now and will want in the future. FIS experts talk through the trends transforming payments and what they mean for your business. They give you an in-depth view of how consumers pay when shopping online and at the point of sale in 40 different markets, along with the latest insights into real-time payments and what's going on in Europe and across the world. Discover how the latest payment technology could affect your business. Get your report today by visiting fisglobal.com slash GPR. FIS, advancing the way the world pays, banks, and invests. At the end of the day, your customer has to be the center of everything you do. This starts with the right data strategy as well as the right foundation to solve the challenges that typically inhibit success such as data quality, data governance, and data connectivity. MParticle is your real-time customer data infrastructure that helps accelerate your data strategy by cleansing, visualizing, and integrating your data strategy from anywhere to anywhere. Ultimately, better data leads to better decisions, better customer experiences, and better outcomes. In fact, some of the best brands in retail, financial services, hospitality, media, travel, gaming, and many other industries rely on MParticle. Learn more by visiting mparticle.com. Better data, better decisions, and better outcomes. Welcome back. I'm joined today by Matthew Wilcox, President of Digital Payments and Data Aggregation at Pfizer. We've been discussing some of the major changes, challenges, and opportunities in today's payments ecosystem. So Matt, with so many changes happening in payments, what is being expected by financial institutions from firms like Pfizer for your competition? What is being demanded and what are your challenges in meeting these needs? Yeah, uh, we hear a lot around real time. Um, so how can you, Pfizer, advance real-time payments? How can you help us take advantage of uh, the new ecosystem or rails that are being put into place from a real-time standpoint, whether it's the Fed or the Clearinghouse or Zelle? Uh, we hear a lot, Jim, around um, integration. Give me a better integrated experience. 
both from the payment standpoint and from the uh, integration into uh, the mobile or digital experience, as we talked about in the previous segment, um, there's recognition now that they have to offer a better user experience. And with that as well, we're getting pushed on creating a more advisory approach, and that's utilization of data into the experience. Long been a topic um, near and dear to your heart. Um, uh, you know, started with, with the work that you used to do long ago with onboarding, mm -hmm. and onboarding was based on trigger and data that the financial institution had about the consumer, and they could infuse that into the experience. That's now become that now has to happen in real time has to happen in session in real time and um, we're, we're being pushed on enriching the data as well so you've got firms like MX um, like OnDot who uh, is part of Fiserv now that really has this sophisticated level of enriching and cleansing the data and putting it back to the consumer in a usable format but it's not just about putting it back in a usable format it's embedding that into the experience and into the flows of the consumer. And then I think the last thing that we're getting pushed on uh, quite a bit, which we're excited about, um, is cryptocurrency. You know, and I read in your articles all the time about Jamie Dimon's skepticism on, on crypto, but it's, it's, it's the real deal. It is becoming more mainstream, uh, and we're seeing lots of firms uh, pop up with that, and we're seeing those firms that are uh, – that have established themselves as cryptocurrency providers moving into other realms of financial services. And so this is another thing to our previous segment, making sure that the financial institutions have a watchful eye on these firms that are providing crypto because they're going to start offering more traditional like banking services. Man, you've, you've unpacked a lot right there. You know, you, you mentioned <laughs> about data and analytics. And as you and I have discussed over the phone and on stage at events, financial institutions certainly have not mastered the immense potential of predictive real-time analytics or the modernization yep. of data, resources, and skill sets. How do financial institutions master this imperative? And what role should third parties play in making it so these financial institutions can really catch up? Yeah, I, I, I answer the second part of your question first. Third parties need to play a massive role. Um, when you think about firms like Fiserv and the data that we have around a financial institution, we've got non-card payment data. We've got card data. We've got core banking data. We have bill pay, P2P data. We have data from the merchants that we know that the the, the consumers at those financial institutions shop at. Um, we have all the data that could enable uh, and, and really signal the right advisory approach to manage the full financial life of a consumer. The client or the consumer or the financial institution needs to play a role in recognizing that they've got to work to get that data into a central place. They've got to have a repository for that data. And they really need to understand what use cases or what they want to do with it first. And you and I both know this. Oftentimes, people get overwhelmed with the amount of data, and they don't know what to do with it. And then you're having to go back to try to figure out, okay, what should we do with this data? If you go in, uh, not a solution in search of a problem, but with a problem that you want to solve with all of that data, uh, you can get to a use case or utilization of that data fairly quickly. Uh, and it doesn't have to be uh, shiny object kind of stuff. It can be embedding or prompting them based on um, their payment history, knowing that they may run into a problem. If they scheduled that payment on the 15th of the month, but they're not going to get paid till the 17th of the month, and that 15th month, that payment on the 15th is going to put them into overdraft. overdraft. Financial institutions have all that data to prompt them to do right. something else, either move that payment date out, mm -hmm. move money into that account, um, more simple type things that just isn't happening with the data. And so it's, it's really figuring out what do you want to do with that data and then and then going from there. You know, it's interesting. We, we've talked about it in the past about the need for speed of decisions. And, you know, we, we go back in our history between you and I and the amount of time it took to, to decide on a mobile banking provider at the financial institution yep. you used to work at. And, and those days of being able to make decisions in a 12 to 18 month period are long gone. And I talk on the podcast quite often in 
my articles that it's better to make an imperfect decision today with a third party provider than a perfect decision 18 to 24 months because you'll never catch up. And yep. I think organizations have to really embrace the concept of using third party providers they can trust that they're not going to have to run down the field with the ball with the provider, but can be able to let go of the ball and have the provider get them down the field. And, and you know, Pfizer is a good example. You know, there's so many third party providers out there. You got to find the right mix, but you can't spend forever trying to evaluate them because right. every moment lost is a is a is an opportunity lost and uh, you know you referenced it just now that to look at use cases and saying where do i get my my quick victory and you know i remember you back in the banking days you know you were all about how can i how can our organization how can my department look good quickly so we can get further investment that that that's a common Correct. sense way of doing business but the way organizations have to work now how can you make quick changes to make a big impact. You know, one other thing your research found was 52% of financial institutions perceived their future future operating model to be a full service banking organization with 35% saying that they'll be a, almost use a, a banking as a service model. How do you see this playing out? Where do you see the consolidation occurring? And can every institution play the way they think they want to play? Yeah. So I see it, uh, and this is a this is a kind of a chicken answer, but I see both. Uh, and I see if you're a full service bank, uh, one of the services you should provide is bank as a service. Yeah. Um, and uh, fintechs should become one of the greatest clients for financial institutions because they need financial services. Uh, they don't have the wherewithal, many of them, I shouldn't say all, but many of them don't have the wherewithal to handle the regulatory environment um, that comes with having your own um, uh, bank or becoming your own bank. And so they need those bank as a service, those sponsor bank models. I mean, you remember long ago, we were a little bit of ahead of our time in, in trying to establish and set that up. And now it's become something fairly significant for the larger institutions who've been doing bank as a service for a number of years. People don't realize that this bank as a, as a service model has really been around for a number of years. Yeah. Um, and so I do think you have to, the, the banks will, continue and need to be full service banking. I don't think that that is going to go away, but the way that that full service banking is going to be different. Uh, you know, our mutual friend, Brett King has often talked about the death of some form of full service banking, but that'll just move to a different mechanism or a different way for the consumer to engage with their financial institution. And that's part of building out that supreme experience. Bank as a service um, is going to be incredibly important because there is going to be a lot of startup companies, whether they're fintech, insuretech, or whatever they might be, they'll need those servicings from a financial institution. They want to have that white label experience of offering financial services, but they need you know, the PNCs and the U.S. banks and the Wells Fargo's of the world behind them. And even the regional banks and the community banks can get involved in this yeah. space. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, you know, it's 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 such a dynamic nature right now. And, and organizations are there's so many priorities. There's so many things they have to balance. And it's hard to find a new business model at the same time you're trying to fix your payment mechanism. At the same time, you're just trying to become a digital bank that actually does things in a digital way as opposed to yep. simply digitizing the analog back office. So, you know, Correct. the elephant in the room, you've referenced it in more than one answer today is that 75% of respondents are exploring the relationship between digital currency and the traditional bank payment system. Yep. What are you seeing as what could be the future? And what is your team at Pfizer doing to, to set up your systems and everything else for the future of what could be cryptocurrency being the dominant payment mechanism? Yeah, we, we see cryptocurrency evolving fairly quickly and fairly dramatically. Um, we have seen, like the article you guys had out recently, we do see a predominantly being used today as an investment mechanism. Mm -hmm. People want to get into it because they see the valuations and the fluctuations, and so that's an exciting thing. So people are thinking about it in terms of kind of like a stock, to be quite honest with you. Um, 
but that's quickly evolving to being a full mainstream currency. Uh, we see higher demand uh, in March than we did in December or January for point of sale. Yeah. Uh, we've the number of merchants, large and small, that want to accept it at point of sale has grown fairly dramatically just in the last three to six months. Uh, the number of financial institutions that want to have a platform for buy, sell, hold trading uh, embedded into their digital experience, um, you know, and companies like Nidig and others yep. that have built these beautiful tools that I know you've had, I believe, on your show or at least referenced in your articles, um, have done a really great job. And so there, we're working with providers like that. Um, and we're also seeing, and this, this will sound really simple, Jim, but if you think about the old school PFM use case where, you know, Jim, you've got your primary accounts at, say, a PNC, but you've got accounts at Ally or HSBC or wherever, you want to see all of that in your PNC digital experience. We now are aggregating cryptocurrency data to allow for that to be part of that PFM experience. So if you think about a financial institution being able to offer a full view of your wallet, um, banks need to aggregate and bring in that cryptocurrency data. So when you're at uh, PNC, you want to log in. You also want to see your Coinbase wallet in your PNC digital experience. Yeah. And so that is another thing um, that has to happen. And I think the last thing that I'd mention is I think cryptocurrency is going to create um, uh, a really nice ecosystem for real-time payments cross-border because you think that these networks of crypto have been established cross-border. Um, we think that that's going to accelerate um, dollars moving cross-borders uh, in a very nice and simple way, and it'll be extensions of existing applications. So it, a bank may have an existing transfers application for account to account. Well, pretty soon you'll be able to convert dollars to crypto and move those from uh, Brexville, Ohio to London. And uh, mm -hmm. we think that that is something that's going to happen within the next 12 months. You know, it, it's an amazing place to be right now. I, I talk about it every podcast I do that, you know, banking has never been more exciting, but it's never been more challenging. Um, you know, Fiserv is a legacy financial institution. In fact, all the core providers are. And so you're facing some of the same challenges that traditional banks are facing. You're, you're having to iterate different thought patterns. You're having to stay ahead of the curve. You're having to train massive number of people on all these new solutions that are out there and bring everybody up to speed on an ongoing basis. When you look at the banking industry today, what do you see as the biggest challenge that the financial services industry, traditional financial services industry faces around payments? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. I think it, the biggest challenge uh, that I think that folks are going to find is uh, the advancements of new payment use cases is going to continue to accelerate and the demand for the on the banks is going to continue to accelerate. And that puts a lot of demand on companies like Pfizer or FIS or Global Payments um, to accelerate and bring those use cases to financial institutions. And it has to be done in a way where the financial institution can connect once for real time and utilize that connection at their core level uh, for multiple use cases and experiences. Because banks and other companies fraught with tech debt, and so there's a lot of work that they have to do to modernize. We talked a lot about in the previous segment to fix and clean up the back office. That has to be underway. But uh, payments isn't going to wait for everybody to clean up their back office. And so we as processing providers have to find a way to connect a bank one time uh, to multiple networks, ser really serve as a gateway to all of payment networks uh, domestically and globally for all those use cases to take flight. And that includes alternative currency like we just talked about with cryptocurrency. So I think it's the world is moving fast. Payments is moving even faster. You know, it's it's amazing. I, I, I say this on the podcast. You know, my wallet, if it's not in my glove box, it's left at home. Um, I just take my phone and I go to places that I know are going to be able to take mobile payments. And that disconnects me from my traditional financial institution 
every day more and more because I'm more connected to my Apple Pay or my Apple phone or my digital payments, whatever it may be. And that's just one element. That's the point of sale situation. But you look at the way you transfer money be between people. You know, you're not quite there yet, I don't think, with your oldest daughter. But you're going to get to the point where Venmo becomes the only way you communicate with her. Um, I know that with my son, you know, he is continuously, you know, communicating back and forth. We're, in fact, today, we, we transfer a little bit of money because of the brackets um, being done for the NCAAs. <laughs> but, but you think about that. We used to do that by checks. And it's not that long ago. And... Yeah. If anybody thinks about how fast things can happen, we did not have the lexicon of buy now, pay later 18 months ago. And while yep. it's not a brand new service, it's layaway digital, the reality is it's disrupted the entire payments ecosystem. You know, the biggest p payment provider out there, PayPal, said that they were disrupted by Klarna and Affirm. I mean, the reality is even yep. fintech firms are being disrupted by other fintech firms as it comes to new solutions. Right. What's the next solution on the horizon? Who knows? But I think we have to realize that change isn't going to slow down. It, 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 it is right now faster than ever, and consumers are driving it when it used, used to be that we used to control that, that whole speed mechanism. So we've Agreed. talked about the challenges. And to finish it off today, what is the greatest opportunity that you see? And I'll say in the near future because, man, we can't we can't project too far out there. Yeah, I think the greatest opportunity. Um, I'll quickly. I think the evolution of real time, but I, I think that's that's happening, uh, and I think there's lots of work going on in that. I really think the biggest area of opportunity <clears throat> for financial institutions is integrating all of these payment assets and use cases and management of payments into one ecosystem. You know, Wells Fargo has done a good job with their control tower experience. Jim, I know you're like me at, at your house. You got Hulu, Netflix, uh, Disney Plus, Amazon, Apple TV. You have all of these subscriptions that you now have to manage. And the number of payments that a consumer is making today, uh, and our research shows this, has grown immensely. Yeah. Uh, so we went through that period of payment consolidation where your cable phone or satellite or alarm bill became one bill because it consolidated into providers. But now it's just accelerated with uh, uh, all these other, including including buy now, pay later. You know, I have payments that I make to a firm now from my financial institutions. I think financial institutions, if they can build out an integrated ecosystem, and I'm not just talking about a fancy way of doing mobile or online banking, but actually being able to manage card on file, manage payments for, for non-card on file, uh, and managing um, going to one place in one platform where I see pictures of the people that I pay all the time, the businesses that I pay, the bills that I pay, management of my subscriptions, I think that's a tremendous opportunity for financial institutions and one that a Venmo or somebody else can't easily replicate. Um, so I don't know if uh, your son will go to Wells Fargo to start talking to you uh, anytime yeah. soon, but I think that you can get to that point where it's if it's all there, that's what a consumer wants. They want ease of use and management. And if, imagine if you could marry that up with the trust and safety and security that we know financial institutions spend significant investment on protecting. You know, it's a very good point. It really gets down to data and analytics to drive a better experience. And it really is one of these things where I can only predict what you're going to do next if I know what you've done in the past. In addition, the more I learn about you, the better I'm going to be able to serve you and get a value proposition. I talk about the fact that, you know, who would have thought we'd pay $125 a year for the ability to shop digitally? And that's what we do with Amazon. Yeah. That not, We're not getting it because of free shipping or anything like that. But the reality is, We'll pay for value. And the value is really taking all this payment data, all the things that we're doing daily, and having you think on my behalf. I, I got frustrated. Right. You mentioned Wells Fargo, and I, I've mentioned them in the past. I got frustrated when Wells Fargo about two years ago asked me, when, what do you want your minimum balance or your minimum balance to be where we notify you your balance are low. I'm going, you've had a relationship with me 15 years. You know those dates better than me, and it's not the same from the 1st to the 15th or Correct. from the 15th to the 30th. That utilization of data that we're becoming used to, as you mentioned, all the TV services, you know, we're getting used to organizations and, and technology making decisions for us and putting us in the right direction. GPS system, as Leah knows, I mentioned probably in every podcast that, you know, I want the GPS financial services. I know where I want yes. to go. Help me get there. 
And yep, it gets more and it. more frustrating from a relationship basis, the more services I use. If I'm using Acorns here and PayPal here and Wells and PNC and all these different, and SoFi and, and Ally, that keeps on getting disintegrated as far as relationships. All of a sudden my engagement gets disintegrated and we've lost what used to be the traditional loyalty. And and I, you know, Matt, this has been a great conversation. I, I, I'm i sorry it's taken so long for us to get together <laughs> um, in public because I think it's amazing what's being done. But, you know, I, I, I wanted to bring up at the end of the, the podcast that, you know, for those organizations who say, geez, their core providers aren't providing everything. Remember, they're, they're uh, traditional financial institutions as well. They're legacy organizations fighting some of the yep. same battles. And in with a moving train. You know, we're, we're all trying to catch up. So, Matt, thank you so much for being on the show today. Jim, my friend, thank you. It's always wonderful to see you. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform. Ray is a top banking podcast and winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. If you enjoyed what we're doing, please take some time to show some love in the form of a review. It helps us continue to get great guests like today. Finally, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and check out the research we're doing on the Digital Banking Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Longbreak, audio engineer, Sean Roe Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, innovation is everybody's responsibility, not just research and development. Thank <music> you.